uh, I thought that I will uh, uh, talk about nuclear fission. Uh, you, you know, uh, uh, you saw that uh, both Bosch and uh, uh, and Langmuir uh, they got their Nobel uh, uh, Prize in 1932. In that same year, 1932, there were some seminal findings, okay, which I will share with you, and those were instrumental in the subsequent uh, discovery of uh, nuclear fission. Although most people tend to call it discovery of nuclear fission, I'm not called it a uh, discovery. I see it more as an invention uh, because it, there is an intervention. There is an intervention uh, by humankind okay, to affect the fission. It's not a natural uh, observation you know, uh, that's happening. That's why I would rather call it an invention than a uh, discovery. Now, let me uh, show you uh, the uh, how important uh, it is. Uh, what kind of a scientist would have uh, uh, invented or discovered nuclear fission? Do you think? Sort of physicist. You know, there's nothing wrong okay, in thinking that it likely would have been a physicist. This is the first surprise. Right? Uh, the person who got the Nobel Prize for nuclear fission is Otto Hahn. And got it for what? Nobel Prize in chemistry. Okay. And what was Otto Hahn? Started his career in synthetic organic chemistry. And uh, uh, then uh, became a first-rate analytical uh, uh, scientist. You know? so he was like an analytical chemist. He and this person okay, were, uh, were uh, uh, two. Strassman used to work uh, along with Hahn. Uh, you know, these were the people who, uh, who uh, uh, really did the very path-breaking work, which actually helped to understand what is happening. Okay? And this lady, Lisa Meitner, okay? she was a physicist. Okay? And uh, uh, tragically for her, she was Jewish, you know, and then uh, she had to escape from Germany okay, because otherwise she would have probably been killed. You know? And uh, so in a way, her uh, career got uh, uh, affected. But one of the most remarkable ladies you know, and, uh, you know, was able to explain uh, why uh, nuclear uh, energy uh, or fission uh, gives uh, so much of energy. Okay? And uh, now, but the people on whose work, you know, uh, all of this finally happened okay, was uh, none other than Mary Curie, extremely important. This man, Italian, Enrico Fermi, okay, Mary Curie's daughter, Irene Curie, her husband, Joliot Curie, Joliot Curie was a chemical engineer okay, and uh, absolutely brilliant guy. Okay. And if anybody says, you know, it becomes so fashionable to talk about out of the box thinking, right? Uh, when in fact, uh, it's just pulling ourselves and there's nothing so out of the box uh, in any of our thinking, okay? But I'll show you what is meant by out of the box thinking. Okay? And that was this lady, uh, Ida Nordak, uh, and uh, this person, uh, uh, Otto Frisch, who first coined the term. Uh, nuclear fission, uh, drawing on uh, an analogy with biological systems, and uh, we know about fission of uh, cells. Okay, uh, so uh, so that's what it is. Now, Lisa Meitner, uh, uh, you know, said something very beautiful in 1963. I said the discovery of nuclear fission by Otto Hahn and Chris Trustman opened up a new era in human history, and then she says. It seems to me that what makes the science behind this discovery so remarkable is that it was achieved by purely chemical means. What a re remarkable thing. You know? <laughs> it was not by uh, the nuclear physicists who uh, provided the understanding. All right. So uh, let me uh, uh, go through. Okay. And as I have been doing in many of these, I actually want you to follow the trajectory, okay, through which things happen. Right? 
So uh, let me uh, start and I'll uh, quote from uh, uh, Otto Hahn's uh, uh, Nobel lecture. Uh, but before that, you know, it's also very interesting to know that Otto Hahn actually got the Nobel Prize in 44, 1944. Okay? But at that time, he was in jail. You know? Why was he in jail? Because, you know, everybody who was uh, suspected uh, a German and to be a, a German agent, you know, was uh, picked up by the Allied forces. You know? And uh, so he was holed up somewhere in England. You know? And uh, when he got the Nobel Prize, and he could not uh, go there and uh, get the prize. Uh, and uh, then he was again uh, re-invited in 1946 uh, to deliver his uh, uh, Nobel lecture. You know, he had sent a, a Nobel lecture in 1944, uh, but then uh, uh, tragically, you know, uh, between then and when he finally uh, received his prize, uh, we had the bombing of Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki, you know, and that so devastated him you know, uh, that uh, he wrote a postscript. Uh, after that for uh, uh, for his Nobel lecture. And this is what Professor Tiselius, who uh, introduced uh, Otto Hahn, you know, for his Nobel lecture said, the discovery of the fission of heavy nuclei has led to consequences of such a nature that all of us, indeed the whole of humanity, look forward with great expectations, but at the same time with great dread to further developments, you know, because that uh, bombing and uh, what calamity can happen uh, with nuclear uh, uh, fission, uh, these people understood and they had seen uh, what uh, what what uh, America did. You know, doesn't matter, you know, how much you talk about Pearl Harbor and this that to have actually gone and uh, known that I'm going to kill, you know people by uh, the hundreds of thousands, okay? uh, that was uh, uh, as cruel as uh, uh, it can be. It's also very interesting, look at it. Do you see the name of any American here? No, but they created the bomb, okay? And uh, you know they got Enrico Fermi to uh, uh, move over to uh, the US, you know, Einstein fled to the US, okay? and uh, uh, you know, these were the people who uh, uh, then uh, really were uh, instrumental in uh, uh, starting the program in uh, in the U.S. And there were great scientists in Berkeley, okay, in California. And later on, of course, the largest project ever in history, uh, which is known as the Manhattan Project, you know, which was to make the nuclear bomb. Okay. So, uh, so that's what it is. Okay. But look at Hahn uh, saying that how, and this is from his auto autobiography, you know, uh, not from the Nobel lecture, you know, so I read his autobiography and I, uh, this is what he says, I owe it to the father of my doctorate, Theodore Zinke. He was an organic chemist working on aromatic substitution reactions. That of course I've written. That after two years as his assistant, I was able to go to England and work with Sir William Ramsey. Who is William Ramsey? You have seen Ramsey and Young, okay? But this William Ramsey's contribution that he's talking about, you know, is uh, uh, the, that Ramsey was the one who introduced the entire, you know, uh, the group of the period, the Nobel gases. He was the one who discovered all the Nobel gases, including helium. Okay. And uh, so that's what uh, William Ramsey did. And he got an opportunity to work with Ramsey. I will also show you from where William Ramsey got his helium from. Okay. And why did he go there? Because, you know, uh, he was told, okay, that look, if you, and he, he, Han wanted a job, you know, just like you all look for your jobs after placement. Okay. And uh, Han was told, look, now at that time that to get a job in Germany, uh, you better go to England and first also learn some English yeah? uh, because, uh, you know, the British were uh, uh, really leaders in many ways okay? and said that uh, you go there. And, uh, you know, uh, Ramsey uh, uh, was the one who guided him uh, to uh, uh, work in the area of radioactivity and later on uh, 
Han got an opportunity to work with uh, uh, Rutherford as well. Okay, so uh, uh, you know that's uh, his trajectory. Look from an organic chemist, all right, uh, and and then uh, where he ended up. That's another thing, you know. There's nothing static uh, about what you do. And just like you know, so many people who study engineering, uh, who uh, who go on to do management, there's nothing wrong. I've seen a lot of people say, hey, how could you, you know, you wasted your uh, education? Not really. Uh, I must have uh, uh, acquired certain skills. Or I remember, you know, I used to uh, uh, be on this uh, uh, UPSC exam uh, interview committees, you know, and where you select these IAS, IFS people. And I used to be surprised. I found that a lot of them were uh, IIT BTECs. They, they are the ones who were uh, joining the uh, uh, IES, IFS, you know, nothing wrong. Uh, you can shift your uh, career, okay? <clears throat> okay, now let us look at, all right, uh, let's slowly uh, get into the subject. Okay? And uh, of course, uh, we know that uh, uh, the fission that uh, took place uh, was the uranium fission, okay? And uh, what, uh, Otto Hahn talking about uh, is, uh, you know, what was known about uranium, you know, in the early years. Okay? And uh, he says that for more than 100 years, uranium discovered by Klaproth in 1789 had had a quiet existence as a somewhat rare but not particularly interesting element. After its inclusion in the periodic system by Mendeleev and Lothar Meyer, it was distinguished from all other elements in one particular respect. It occupied the highest place uh, in the table of the elements. Okay, so this is uranium. Nothing was known uh, with a higher uh, uh, atomic weight because it's been, uh, well, atomic number uh, too, because this is, of course, the mostly periodic table that I'm uh, showing you. Mm -hmm. As yet, however, that did not have any particular significance. Uh, I was just thinking that, uh, uh, you know, and when he's writing his novel lecture, uh, probably, uh, I don't know whether Han uh, uh, knew about uh, uh, Haber's work, uh, where, uh, uh, you know, he had used uranium as one of the catalysts for the nitrogen fixation, along with osmium. Uh, so it looks like uh, uh, Han didn't uh, pay much heat. That's because uh, it didn't really ultimately succeed uh, as a catalyst. And uh, as you know, uh, BSF uh, uh, went on to uh, develop other uh, catalysts. Okay? Uh, but let me tell you uh, that uranium played a path-breaking role okay? in the early formative stages of the Haber uh, process. Well, uh, let's look at uh, uh, now uh, going into the area of uh, uh, a little more uh, in the direction towards <laughs> nuclear fission. How did this all start? It started because of the work of Ron Jen you know, and, uh, and that he had uh, discovered X-rays uh, from the cathode ray tube. Okay? And this person, uh, Becquerel, you know, Henry Becquerel, okay? we will be uh, talking about another Becquerel uh, when we talk about the photovoltaic cell. You know? And you know what Becquerel had found is that uh, uh, there were some uh, uh, compounds, minerals, uh, which looked uh, fluorescent. Okay, and uh, Becquerel uh, thought that they are fluorescent; they're glowing uh, because of uh, uh, because of sunlight. You know? and at that time, uh, you know, the quantum, okay, the understanding of uh, uh, E is equal to H nu was still not develop, you know. And so uh, people would have thought, Becquerel would have thought that if I, uh, let's say, uh, accumulate uh, or if a mineral keeps uh, soaking up more and more uh, uh, solar energy, you know, maybe who knows, it might start, uh, uh, it could have absorbed so much energy uh, that uh, uh, when it releases energy, uh, maybe it will come out as an X-ray. Okay? And, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's the way uh, they thought, you know. Uh, it's like, you know, 
uh, if you don't know and if you keep on heating something okay and you don't know that it will level up at a particular temperature okay, and you keep on heating and thing uh, of course it will generate more heat it will uh, but it won't generate at, uh, heat at a higher temperature uh, which is the uh, what a x ray would have had to do uh, that it could have been at a much higher energy uh, um, radiation uh, but uh, obviously, that knowledge did not exist at that time. And it, during one of his experiments, you know, when he had uh, left these things outside, okay, uh, he, you know, the it was an overcast uh, uh, condition, and uh, and you know that thought probably I don't know maybe that thought may have he may have done this experiment before also, but at that moment he said. Are these things are still uh, fluorescing. Why are they fluorescing? It's overcast. There's no sun. It's not soaking up the uh, energy from the sun. So why is it fluorescing? Okay. And he and he conceived the idea, you know, of certain elements, you know, certain minerals uh, being in a pre-energized state, right? which he called as natural. Radioactivity. I mean, he called it radioactivity, uh, but uh, uh, it was uh, uh, today, as we know, they are naturally radioactive. Now, uh, once that had been done, you know, and uh, 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 Becquerel had found this uh, uh, natural radioactivity, okay, uh, that uh, things which are in a pre energized state, uh, that it was then uh, that uh, Marie Curie uh, had. Uh, uh, you know, found uh, that uh, some of the constituents uh, in this uh, are things like polonium, which was later on, of course, coined as polonium, uh, and uh, radium. Okay. And uh, so I'll, let me read out what Hans says in his lecture. The echo of Becquerel's fundamental observations on the radioactivity of uranium in scientific circles was at first fairly weak. Two years later, however, they acquired an exceptional importance when the Curies succeeded in separating uh, from uh, uranium minerals two active substances, polonium and radium, of which the latter appeared to be several million times stronger than the same weight of uranium. And how did uh, Marie Curie uh, find this thing? You know, how, how did uh, uh, Marie Curie get to uh, radium? Now, if you look at the periodic table, okay, uh, you see that uh, uh, you know radium is also an alkaline earth uh, element. Okay, so uh, uh, strontium, barium, calcium, radium—I mean, they're all uh, uh, alkaline earth. Now, at that time, uh, she discovered something very, very interesting, uh, which was that uh, you know she she uh, took some barium chloride, you know, and added uh, uh, sulfate and it precipitated of course as barium sulfate because the solubility product is uh, very low as you know okay but what happened is that if you have certain elements which are similar like radium you know uh, the and even if the radium's uh, solubility product radium sulfate uh, has not been exceeded uh, but it co-precipitates along with the with the barium sulfate, okay, and in that way, uh, you have got your barium and your radium, you know, out, and all the other stuff which is there in the ore, you know, those things could uh, remain. So you have more or less now got a, a relatively uh, a purer kind of a mixture of uh, barium sulfate and radium sulfate, okay. So that is co precipitation that something precipitates even though uh, it's. Uh, its actual concentration would uh, uh, make it uh, uh, not precipitable uh, that the solubility product is not exceeded. But because of the presence of the barium sulfate, uh, you know, the two can't be distinguished and it acts as if uh, the overall uh, solubility product of radium has been exceeded. Okay. So uh, at that point, what, what uh, Marie Curie did uh, was a very interesting uh, uh, work. And for those of you, uh, who have taken the industrial engineering chemistry course, uh, and you will recall uh, uh, the Leblanc process, you know, uh, where uh, uh, he took uh, uh, sodium uh, 
uh, sulfate, okay, and uh, uh, you know heated it up with uh, carbon, and uh, basically uh, it got converted into sodium sulfide. You know. So in similar manner, uh, barium sulfate, and uh, when I say barium sulfate, uh, it would apply to radium sulfate as well. You know that you heat it up with carbon, okay, and it forms barium sulfide, and <clears throat> After that, you know, when you treat it with HCl, as we know, uh, it'll get converted into barium chloride, okay, and release H2S, okay, and uh, so likewise, uh, radium sulfate will also become radium chloride. Now, then uh, Marie Curie found uh, that uh, the radium chloride has slightly less solubility uh, than uh, barium chloride. So each time uh, she did a fractional crystallization. Uh, in the precipitate, there would be a slightly higher uh, concentration of radium chloride, you know, relative to what it was in solution. And believe it or not, you know, in uh, Marie Curie's lecture, uh, she says, I'll pass on maybe her uh, Nobel lecture also uh, to you. And uh, she says that she carried out, in some cases, more than 1,000 fractional crystallization. I mean, you know, so just think of uh, again like Bosch and BSF doing 2000 uh, experiments on the catalyst, you know, to perfect the uh, catalyst for nitrogen fixation. Look at the patience of, of this lady, you know, that can you imagine doing a thousand fractional crystallization? You know? So they would start with tons of material and end up probably getting a, a gram. Of, uh, of stuff, okay? or less than a gram, maybe a few hundred milligrams. Okay? So, uh, so that's uh, 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 what uh, uh, Mary Curie did, and she was then able to identify uh, radium, you know, and that's how she knew that uh, radium uh, is uh, more than a million times uh, stronger in terms of uh, its radioactivity uh, compared to uh, the uranium ore, you know, which was largely uh, urinal sulfate. Okay. Now, uh, then he says it was only a few years before the first surprising property of this radiating substance was explained. Okay. And who did that? It was uh, Rutherford, as you know, uh, that uh, uh, you know he was able to uh, uh, identify the alpha and the beta rays, you know, emanating from uh, uh, from uh, you know, from radium. Okay. And mind you, had it not been for Mary Curie and her being able to enrich, you know, and get sufficiently concentrated form of radium, you know, uh, none of this would have happened because then the alpha rays and uh, beta rays that you would have got uh, would have been too, too dilute, you know, there would be very few counts, okay. Uh, so uh, it, it was all possible because of. Uh, the the enrichment of uh, radium you know uh, through that uh, particular method that i uh, showed you okay and uh, and then of course uh, uh, you know that's where uh, uh, william ramsey came in you know that uh, ramsey was the one uh, who was able to show uh, that the alpha particle is really uh, helium you know uh, helium had been known uh, in uh, in the universe okay but there was Nobody knew that helium uh, or, or the presence of helium in uh, uh, on Earth. Okay, uh, but that you got helium uh, really from the uh, from the radioactive uh, decay, you know, of radium. Okay, uh, it, it gave a source of helium. Okay? So, so that's how uh, helium got uh, discovered. Okay, and uh, and then of course the beta rays were uh, found to be uh, uh, electrons. Okay. And after that, uh, as you know, it was uh, Rutherford who uh, uh, then used uh, the alpha particles to uh, uh, bombard uh, a gold foil and uh, was able to show that uh, an atom is largely empty space uh, with uh, uh, the alpha particles uh, uh, really just uh, going through, you know, uh, undeflected. And, uh, but uh, there were a few, okay, which backscattered. And uh, that's how he knew uh, that there is a very dense uh, positive charge you know, 
uh, and and so you know the typical uh, uh, pi model you know where uh, 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 positive and negative charges are all glued together uh, like a pi okay uh, that that model uh, ceased to exist and and that that's what gave our fundamental understanding of uh, of the structure of an atom you know with the central uh, core of uh, nucleus okay so so that was very important and he says uh, by the systematic study of the penetration of alpha particles through thin layers of material rutherford uh, was able to propose his model of the nuclei of chemical atoms according to this view the atoms of the element consist of positively charged nucleus representing uh, practically the whole mass of the atom around which move at a relatively great distance electrons which neutralize the nuclear charge okay the charge of the nucleus undoubtedly represents the position of the element in the periodic system okay so so that was again uh, very important and you remember uh, uh, you, you know uh, uh, i had uh, told you during the introductory lecture uh, that the it was a japanese scientist uh, who had first proposed the saturnian model uh, of the atom and it was not really uh, rutherford but rutherford was the one who first did the experiments you know uh, which proved uh, that that was the case okay so uh, you know so that was very important and uh, wh why was this such a seminal uh, uh, piece of work you see what rutherford found uh, firstly that uh, alpha particles are quite heavy okay because we know that uh, it's got a, a mass of 4 okay whereas an electron has a mass of 1 over 1800 no so it was very heavy okay and uh, uh, rutherford found that uh, you know as it was coming out from the radium uh, during the radioactive decay uh, the alpha particles are coming out at a tremendous velocity 15000 km per second so you can imagine the momentum uh, that is created the mv you know and so it was like a magic bullet you know and uh, so that bullet uh, really uh, is what enabled uh, uh, the alpha particles to uh, come so close to the nucleus uh, notwithstanding the fact that the uh, nucleus is positively charged you know and uh, so that was very important uh, uh, by the way i also you know uh, Uh, started thinking and uh, these are all uh, uh, stupid things you know uh, you don't have to uh, uh, take any of this seriously you know but i was just thinking that who knows uh, maybe uh, uh, uranium is a, a good catalyst for the heber process because uh, you know at this kind of uh, momentum i mean what is it to break a nitrogen molecule you know it's simple uh, but i don't think that's the method i think it's probably Uh, much more chemical okay uh, but uh, but let me tell you i i was looking around i really did not find uh, much work where uh, uh, let's say the catalytic uh, properties of radioactive substances uh, has been studied i was thinking that because they are so high in energy and it's so easy for them to uh, overcome the activation barrier and especially for exothermic reactions you know after that you can sustain it Okay, that maybe uh, uh, you know radioactive uh, elements could be catalysts. Okay. Uh, well, then of course uh, we know that uh, uh, Rutherford, of course, uh, was the person who did the first you know modern day uh, transmutation of uh, one element to another. You know, very bombarded uh, 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 nitrogen. Okay, with uh, uh, with alpha particles. Okay, and uh, it. got converted into uh, oxygen okay and it released a proton okay and and a uh, considerable amount of energy okay so this is huge you know it was you know one of the greatest experiments ever ever done uh, in transmuting uh, uh, one uh, and certainly the first one uh, of one element into uh, another you know uh, and uh, you know so so that was very interesting and not only that you see this was the first example also where uh, i mean uh, in radioactivity you know a large molecule fragments and breaks down into smaller uh, uh, atomic uh, uh, mass you know atomic number but in this particular case that i could take something with a lower atomic mass 
or an atomic number and increase it to a higher atomic mass and atomic number that okay. so uh, so that was again uh, very uh, significant and han says here for the first time was an artificial transmutation of atoms actually a building up of atoms since an oxygen of mass 17 was produced from a nitrogen of mass 14 on account of the positive charge of the alpha particle this type of reaction did not succeed in bringing about nuclear transmutations of the heavy element now why did it not succeed in uh, with the heavy elements you know uh, what they found is that they could use the lighter atoms things like oxygen uh, nitrogen uh, you know beryllium you know they could do that uh, but when they tried to uh, do similar experiments with heavy atoms uh, it didn't work you know? what was the reason so more protons so more fantastic repulsion. which means that you had a much higher uh, you know charge density you know? Uh, because uh, uh, you you having such a large number of uh, positive charge in an extremely small uh, volume of space okay uh, so uh, so that, that that's the reason you know uh, that they could not uh, uh, do it okay but but the interest had been created now uh, what then happened and uh, look the year 1932 okay? and uh, you know this is remarkable because uh, uh, this is the same year when uh, Langmuir and Bosch got their uh, Nobel Prize, and this was uh, some of the most seminal, you know, work on uh, uh, radioactivity, uh, and uh, especially after the work of uh, Becquerel and Marie Curie and Rutherford had been uh, done. Now, this was the time, you know, when in that one year, uh, three major things happened. Okay? First was uh, that the positron was uh, discovered. Okay? Positron, as you know. Uh, is basically like a, uh, is 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 not like a proton uh, is more like an electron in mass but is positively charged you know very very important uh, discovery uh, second was uh, that this was the time when they found heavy hydrogen you know deuterium okay and tritium and uh, you know this was again seminal because this is in 1932 for the first time people could understand uh, that uh, the whole business of uh, isotopes that you can have the same uh, atomic number and yet you can have different atomic mass which you did not have let's say in Mendeleev's days you know, the periodic table and even mostly had made his uh, 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 periodic table but mostly had no understanding of isotopes okay and uh, so that was uh, uh, extremely uh, important okay and uh, there was uh, this fantastic seminal experiment which was uh, done okay where uh, uh, you know people uh, were able to uh, uh, bombard uh, beryllium uh, with uh, alpha particles okay and uh, you know uh, today what we know uh, is uh, uh, of course that uh, it, it they knew that it got converted into carbon you know, but nobody could explain at that time uh, that actually what is the total mass balance uh, that is taking place in this whole system okay there were many different speculations many different people were uh, involved in this work i don't want to go into the uh, detail of that okay uh, they found gamma radiation also okay but it was uh, chadwick in england uh, who really uh, ultimately wrote this equation you know and then uh, formulated the concept of a neutron okay? that uh, that there a neutron uh, must be uh, uh, coming out uh, because you know that's the only way uh, that you can have uh, 9 and 4 13 okay and uh, how you can explain uh, that how you are otherwise forming uh, carbon okay so there must have been a neutral heavy spark species uh, which is coming out okay because the atomic numbers were matching four plus two is six and here is six and therefore uh, you know uh, Chadwick was the one who proposed uh, that uh, it releases a neutron now neutron release was considered to be uh, of seminal importance can anyone tell me why and uh, 
uh, you know, consider the experiments of Rutherford uh, on with alpha particles, etc. Why sir, was the yeah? Sir, uh, because it does not have charge, so it can also hit a larger molecule. Fantastic. Okay, uh, because the neutron is neutral, you know, so they knew that that was the fundamental obstacle uh, with the alpha particle that is positively charged, so it cannot go very very close to the nucleus and it cannot uh, go and uh, go within an interacting distance you know? and uh, you know it will get deflected before that okay? so the whereas the neutron uh, uh, but not just that it was a neutral particle you see the neutron is quite heavy it's just one fourth of the mass of uh, uh, of helium <laughs> okay so it's got an atomic mass of one and so it still provides you a, a, a very high momentum, okay? assuming that it still is coming out at a very high uh, velocity. Okay? So now, for the first time, you had a magic bullet. Okay? And that magic bullet you know, uh, was uh, uh, capable, all right? or at least you know, people thought uh, that uh, maybe you know, uh, we will be able to study uh, the interaction of these things with uh, heavier elements okay so so that was the importance uh, of the uh, of the neutron okay now uh, and of course you know uh, uh, you know the idea would have uh, come into people's mind uh, that uh, look i mean uh, we have got uh, uranium you know as the as the last element in the periodic table okay and uh, who knows what's going to happen, right? When the neutron is uh, interacting with uh, something like uh, uh, uranium, you know, so that interest had been uh, uh, created. Okay? But before that, uh, let me also tell you that uh, another very seminal uh, piece of work that happened, okay, was uh, really the work carried out by the Joliet by Joliet Curie, okay, and the chemical engineer. Okay, and uh, <coughs> Joliet Curie, you see, till that time, uh, what we always had was natural radioactivity. You know, so uh, radium uh, emitted, uh, uh, you know, uh, things, uh, alpha particles and uh, uh, beta uh, radiation. Okay, but there was no uh, concept of artificial radioactivity at that point. Okay? Second, was that most of the work you know which was done uh, were you can call them as alpha p okay alpha p means uh, that i have uh, bombarded uh, uh, an element with uh, alpha radiation and i got p which is a proton coming out okay so those kinds of uh, a lot of studies had had been uh, carried out you know on the alpha p processes okay uh, but uh, uh, relatively uh, not much was known uh, about alpha n you know where uh, i am bombarding with uh, alpha radiation and uh, a neutron is coming out although uh, this is one example you know this is a, a typical alpha n uh, kind of a uh, process okay alpha being uh, used as a uh, projectile okay and uh, uh, a neutron coming out so it's alpha n so what uh, Joliet Curie did uh, was that uh, you know he still continued his studies uh, with alpha radiation at that time you know not with uh, uh, neutron you know and what he found is that in some cases uh, like for example uh, boron you know, when uh, alpha radiation goes and hits boron okay, it gets converted uh, into uh, an activated state, you know, it releases a neutron, okay? And what he found is that the, after the neutron goes off, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, the atomic mass now is 13, so you form nitrogen 13, okay? Uh, that this nitrogen 13 uh, basically decays just like natural radioactivity. It follows the same laws, okay? uh, You have a typical, uh, first order uh, uh, radiation, you know, and uh, 
you know, and uh, slowly it got uh, converted uh, into uh, carbon. Okay, and what he found, and that's where the other important uh, discovery of the positron was very important. You know, because till that time people did not know that there is something called a positron. Okay, so uh, the only way to explain, you know, the conversion of nitrogen uh, to carbon. Uh, was that uh, you know i must have a positive particle coming out from the neutron okay uh, without perturbing the mass okay so it was weightless like the electron okay and so uh, what must be coming out is the positron okay beta plus means positron and beta is uh, electron okay so uh, not just that you know he was then able to also take another fairly light element uh, aluminium and again you know, find a, a very, very similar, uh, similar kind of a thing where it got converted into phosphorus, you know, and then phosphorus emitted a positron and it became uh, uh, silicon. Okay. So, uh, you know, so this was the birth of artificial radioactivity. Okay? And he got the uh, Nobel Prize uh, in 1934, okay, for, uh, for this work, okay, I think around that time. You know? And you can see, that 1932 the positron was uh, discovered by 1934 you know artificial radioactivity had been uh, created okay? now so there was a huge amount of interest okay, in both these areas okay? sir, yeah sir uh, like is was there a reason uh, like why boron and aluminium only like because no, no, they no. are from the same uh, that i uh, know i think that you know they would have uh, probably done experiments with uh, many other elements. You know? Uh, you know, in all cases, it may not have ended up okay, giving a, a reaction, nuclear reaction. Okay? I think that uh, probably, you know, in some cases they got a reaction and some cases it didn't. And maybe, you know, it has something to do with the stability of the nuclear. Okay? Yeah, yes, sir, that's what I thought because they are in the same group. Oh, yeah, so so it's it's possible, but you know, uh, let me tell you the the concept of a group and a periodic table, uh, which is largely dictated by uh, the chemical properties of uh, uh, these things, uh, may not have anything to do uh, with the uh, with uh, with their grouping or uh, behavior in the nucleus. Okay, they might be controlled by completely different things. <clears throat> Okay, now at that time, you see the person who really uh, had the uh, most important role to play uh, in the use of neutrons uh, as a as a bullet for uh, bombarding these uh, heavier elements okay, was Enrico Fermi. Okay? It was Fermi who uh, was able to do it. Now, what I must also tell you is that. It was very, very interesting what they, uh, how they designed their uh, system. Uh, you see, what they did was that they made a pellet of radium and beryllium. Now, radium was emitting the alpha radiation, okay, and the alpha radiation was being absorbed by beryllium, okay, in affecting this reaction. Okay, so basically, I had sequential reactions taking place the emission of the alpha radiation, the, its reabsorption by the uh, beryllium, and they got a very intense source of neutrons you know, through that. Later on, of course, you know, uh, people were able to use the uh, Van de Graaff generator, you know, cyclotrons, etc. Uh, and they were uh, uh, making these uh, neutrons at a uh, very high velocity, okay. But the initial experiments and even what uh, Otto Hahn used, you know, as his source of neutron uh, was really the radium beryllium uh, pellet. Okay? So let's just uh, uh, stick to that, you know. And, uh, you know, and what was Enrico Fermi initially wanting to study? He wanted to really, his focus was also on artificial radioactivity because it created such a sensation in the world, you know. Uh, uh, artificial radioactivity. So he, uh, for me, uh, was able to actually take uh, uh, iodine, you know, and bombard it with neutron, 
okay and he was able to create the iodine uh, in an uh, activated state okay so it's different uh, and in this particular case only a gamma radiation came out and then he was able to show you know that uh, the iodine is in an activated state and unlike the the artificial radioactivity discovered by uh, uh, joliet curie you know in this particular case the decay pathway was uh, through the emission of beta radiation so when i emit beta radiation from the nucleus obviously my atomic number increases because the neutron gets converted into a proton okay so effectively uh, iodine 12853 uh, became xenon 12854 okay and uh, so two things uh, fermi was able to do okay fermi was able to show uh, that uh, uh, neutrons can also induce artificial radioactivity just like the alpha radiation and the neutron could do it from these heavier uh, elements okay like iodine 127 no, is a 53 atomic number no? so much much heavier uh, than what was used earlier okay and second that in this case that you have a beta radiation coming out you know and the significance of that is that it increases the atomic number <coughs> let me also tell you fermi also did another very very interesting piece of work you know where he was able to uh, he realized that uh, these neutrons you know sometimes as they are coming out from this radium beryllium uh, mixture uh, is is extremely fast you know these are very fast neutrons and what he found uh, is that the uh, that the uh, uh, th that the interaction of these very fast neutrons with the nucleus you know is uh, actually the probability uh, is much lower you know whereas if he slowed down the neutrons you know he got a much better cross sectional uh, area for uh, uh, for interaction you know and so uh, uh, you know so he was able to also discover uh, the process by which a neutron can be slowed down you know and today uh, i think many of you know uh, that uh, the way uh, all this uh, uh, nuclear reactors work uh, is that you actually slow down uh, the neutron okay so uh, so you, you know in subsequent uh, years uh, it became a very very uh, important thing okay but there was that was not actually what fermi was after fermi was after something more interesting okay uh, now have a look at this okay uh, this reaction and also think of the periodic table that i uh, told you about and what could have been the interest uh, which fermi may have had next to uh, create a heavier elements then when you say heavier what do you mean like beyond uranium there was no element right? you, you don't mean heavier okay like when i am going from here to here i am not making it heavier so to create doing? newer newer elements like Absolutely. atomic number absolutely okay so it's very important to be precise in your statement okay you are thinking along the right line right uh, and uh, so for me realize that you know if if let's say if i were to be able to bombard uranium you know with a neutron and if it does something similar to iodine and if a beta radiation comes out then could i make element 93 from element 92 okay so that was profound because then you are talking about see in all of these cases they of course broke down whether it was rutherford whether it was joliet curie whether it was fermi they of course you know converted one element to to the other artificially but it was always a known element there was never a new element that was created you know 
So uh, that was the interest, you know, that Fermi had. And I hope you can understand uh, how important uh, uh, the neutron uh, was. You know? So, uh, you know, so uh, let, let me uh, read out, you know, what it says. And Fermi did that experiment and he found that beta radiation is coming out. He actually could find beta radiation. Okay? And uh, so let me look at uh, what it says. Fermi and his co-workers continued their tests through the whole of the periodic system up to uranium. Here also they discovered many transmutations produced by neutrons, including some very rapid ones. They proceeded from the obvious assumption that initially there are produced artificial active short-living uranium isotopes. As these emit beta rays, Fermi inferred that the production of so-called transuraniums takes place. You know? So he thought that he must have made element 93. Okay? And what was interesting was Fermi found not one. He found that it's emitting two beta radiations. And he said, so I must have also created element 94. You know, and you know, so he, uh, 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 you, know, you know, this became very famous. They said new elements have been created which have never been made in the past. Okay. But there were some people, and by the way, uh, you know, depending on the neutron uh, velocity, okay, uh, you, you could actually uh, vary, you know, what was happening. Fermi found that, uh, uh, you, you know, in some cases you can uh, create a, 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 a kind of a artificial uh, 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 element, you know, uh, with, uh, with a, a half-life of 13 minutes. In another case, it was a few seconds. Something was even more, you know. So it all varied with the uh, with the uh, velocity of the neutron. Okay? That was also very interesting. Okay? And then, uh, but it was the 13-minute element, very uh, uh, with the 13-minute half-life, you know, uh, that he uh, suspected uh, that it was decaying uh, to form element 93 and element 94. But you know, uh, there were people who said, hey, how is Fermi so sure, you know, that it did not emit positrons, you know, in which case uh, I will get uh, uh, something with a uh, lower uh, atomic number, not higher, you know. And so some people said, Fermi must be making a mistake, you know, and uh, uh, what is being formed is possibly, you know, uh, things on the left side of the periodic table not on the right side. And uh, so Fermi has not really got the complete uh, charge and ma mass balance uh, uh, right in the system. You know? And so, uh, so there was a huge debate, you know, that was created uh, from Fermi's work. And then, so one was uh, people who advocated that uh, it must be forming things on the left side of the periodic table. Now, let me tell you, that uh, I told you about Ida Nordak, you know, and mind you, this whole business of nuclear uh, related uh, uh, breakthroughs, you know, I, I hope you can see the power of women and women scientists should be especially proud because they outsmarted men, you know, in, in this, there's no question about it, starting from Mary Curie, okay. And uh, so Ida Nordak, when I said, that you know she was an out of the box thinker. Okay? I do not act, and this is what uh, uh, Han says in his lecture. From another direction, I do not act. The objection was raised that all the elements of the periodic system must first be excluded before it was possible to draw the conclusion that an element ninety three had been obtained. I do not accept. What you are just inferring from release of some bitter radiation that you have created a new element? Did you look at the entire periodic table? Did you exclude all the elements that could have been formed? You know, and uh, you know, but then uh, 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 Han says 
this objection was not taken seriously as it appeared to be in opposition to all physical views of nuclear physics okay uh, now what is it okay that uh, uh, what what ida not said and i'll show you from her paper okay and uh, uh, this is what ida not actually said what ida not said and by the way this was published in angewantishimi in 1934 and it is called on the element 93 okay and uh, i uh, it was in german but i managed to get an english uh, translation i i will pass on the paper to you okay and it says one could assume equally well that when neutrons are used to produce nuclear disintegrations some distinctly new nuclear reactions take place which have not been observed previously with proton or alpha particle bombardment of atomic nuclei in the past one has found that transmutations of nuclei only take place with the emission of electrons protons or helium nuclei so that the heavy elements change their mass only a small amount to produce near neighboring elements you know so it will shift a bit to the left or it will shift a bit to the right depending on whether a positive particle like a, a positron or a negative particle uh, or or a, or a uh, alpha particle or a negative one like uh, beta radiation is emitted you know uh, but you know nothing uh, more than that okay now what i did not act then say when heavy nuclei are bombarded by neutrons it is conceivable that the nucleus breaks up into several large fragments in other words you know she was saying the nucleus could be like a puppet you know which you just uh, break into two or three pieces you know and you eat it okay uh, which would of course be isotopes of known elements but would not be neighbors of the irradiated element 1934 this paper is published okay and what does the uh, han say we should point out here that other possibilities did not occur to anyone at that time who said so Uh, already uh, i did not had said you know that you cannot rule out such a possibility how can han say that it had not occurred to somebody it did since the discovery of the neutron and the application of artificial sources of radiation a large number of most unusual nuclear reactions had been discovered the products were always either isotopes of the irradiated substances or the next or at most next but one neighbors in the periodic system the possibility of a breakdown of heavy atomic nuclei into various light ones was considered as completely excluded it was excluded by conventional thinkers it was not excluded by ida nordak no? and so you know this was a lie right and uh, you know it is just that they could not get out of conventional thought process so uh, last time you know uh, we discussed uh, this peculiar uh, uh, situation where uh, fermi had proposed the elements 93 and 94 uh, and uh, there was a lot of objection to that uh, and uh, you know so uh, uh, but then there was no other explanation Uh, for uh, the fact that uh, beta radiation was being emitted so i mean what fermi said was nothing uh, so unreasonable okay but at the same time as i said i mean uh, people like ida nordak were uh, not convinced you know they said you have not exhausted all the elements and likewise you know other people felt uh, that maybe uh, uh, that something is getting missed out and there are elements to the left of uranium you know which are actually being formed and they are not being uh, uh, detected but whatever it is uh, what was important is that you know han being a, 
being a very good analytical uh, scientist, okay, and uh, Meitner, of course, uh, uh, being uh, very good at understanding uh, various pathways, okay, that they they must have felt that they've got a really juicy problem on their hands, and uh, that's all the time things that people uh, uh, really look for. And so, you know, people had suggested that uh, maybe uh, something is being missed out and uh, protactinia uh, to the left uh, is being formed. Uh, so, you know, they uh, said that, uh, uh, well, uh, you know, if it's a question of analyzing, uh, we, we know how to analyze things and probably know it better than uh, anybody else does. And so uh, what they did was that uh, the 13-minute element which they had, uh, 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 which people had talked about, you know, uh, including Fermi, okay. So uh, because 13 minutes also gives some time, you know, I mean, at least you've got 13 minutes as the half-life. Whereas if it is in seconds, uh, it's very difficult to uh, uh, do anything with those kinds of uh, uh, compounds, uh, you know, especially characterizing the uh, the structures and all. Okay. Now, there was another reason why uh, Hahn and Meitner were especially interested uh, because they are the, they were the discoverers of protactinia, you know, this element, PA. Okay. And uh, that was in 1917. Okay. And so they said, hey, if protactinium is what is formed, we know how to analyze protactinium. We are the discoverers of protactinium. Actually, it's not entirely true. Protactinium was uh, uh, earlier, actually, a uh, bit earlier than uh, Hahn and Meitner uh, had been uh, uh, identified by these two people, Fajans and uh, Goring, you know. But they identified a very, very short half-life uh, uh, element, you know. And so uh, people did not take it very seriously, uh, because, whereas uh, uh, what uh, Hahn and Meitner identified was the 231 uh, uh, protactinium, which was relatively more stable, could be characterized. And so they are considered to be the discoverers of uh, protactinium. So uh, they, you know, did that. And uh, there was a method, you know, from the time of Marie Curie, uh, the indicator method. Indicator methods are nothing but something which indicates, okay, uh, the presence of uh, or absence of uh, something. Like uh, when you, uh, uh, when you do a titration, we put in a uh, pH indicator, right? And it indicates the uh, the pH. Okay? So, uh, I mean, that kind of, you know, those are uh, called indicator methods. Okay? And uh, so, uh, they did this work, you know, Hahn and Meitner, and not only uh, protactinia, uh, but uh, they could actually rule out uh, all of these other things also, actinium, uh, thorium, you know, this is actinium, thorium. And also that it was not a uranium uh, isotope, you know? so they excluded uh, uh, uranium as as well, you know. And so, you know, they also came to the conclusion, uh, Hahn and uh, uh, Meitner, that uh, look, I mean, maybe uh, what uh, uh, Fermi is claiming is correct, you know, and uh, and maybe the he did form uh, uh, element uh, 93. And so, uh, uh, you know, that, that's what they uh, thought. Okay. Now, what is very also important to uh, make a note of is that, uh, you know, I told you that uh, the, the velocity of the neutron uh, can be uh, modulated. Okay. And uh, uh, what subsequently was found was that uh, depending on the velocity of neutron, uh, the the behavior uh, of this uh, uranium uh, intermediates and products seem to uh, seem to vary, you know. So whereas Fermi, you know, uh, a lot of the work which was done on the 13-minute element, uh, and then he had also found two uh, things which had a very short uh, uh, life, you know, something like 10 seconds and 40 seconds, you know. And uh, so, uh, and, and they were definitely beta radiating. Okay. Uh, now, uh, so what happened was, you know, uh, that's what, so Fermi came at it from whatever he had observed. Okay? But when Lisa Meitner and Hahn uh, started repeating the experiments of Fermi, okay, 
they uh, did not get the 13 minute element they got you know uh, uh, something with a half life of uh, uh, 23 minutes okay and uh, now we know uh, that uh, it is all because uh, uh, you know the velocity of the neutron uh, was probably uh, varying in the various uh, uh, experiments you know and it had a profound role uh, on uh, uh, on the uh, on on what exactly uh, forms okay and uh, so you know uh, again uh, he was uh, uh, very confused and uh, so he says that uh, uh, Lise Meitner and I found in addition a substance with a half life of 23 minutes which we conclusively established as an artificial radioactive uranium isotope with fermi substances of short life the isotopy with uranium can only be assumed but not proved the 23 minute element occurred without any other radiation conditions in a so called resonance uh, process so so that's what uh, uh, basically he says that uh, uh, he seems to have found as the result of many years of work we han meitner and strassman had finally obtained a great number of artificial uh, active kinds of atoms which all appeared to be formed directly or indirectly by beta radiation from the supposed short living uranium isotopes and which therefore must all represent so called trans uranium okay so nobody disputed this one that uh, fermi had found things with a very short uh, half life you know 10 seconds and 40 seconds uh, but in all of these cases they ended up uh, forming a uh, Uh, relatively stable products by uh, beta radiation release okay and so uh, there was no reason to uh, uh, assume uh, that trans uranium had not been formed okay and so he says that uh, uh, and which therefore must all represent so called trans uraniums elements higher than uranium according to their chemical behavior these could be classified into various groups and since in many cases the gradual production from beta radiating parent substances could be directly observed decay schemes draw, were drawn up extending to elements 95 and 96 i mean they went beyond 94 also in so far as the work was repeated by others the results were always confirmed you know so there was no issue in repeating this okay so you know everybody started gravitating towards the idea uh, of the formation of uh, trans uranium but then something else happened uh what happened was uh, that uh, you know han and meitner were not, not the only ones who were uh, repeating the work of uh, uh, fermi okay uh, uh, mary curie's daughter uh, irene curie and her collaborator savage you know, uh, they published a paper in 19 so i think one paper in 1937 and another in 1938 and they said uh, look what uh, we have found another uh, uh, entity with a half life which was 3.5 hours you know and so everybody was very excited because 3.5 hours means that you have got a fairly long time in your hand you know uh, to actually uh, uh, do uh, uh, analytical work you can even do synthetic work you know uh, when people uh, uh, actually produce you know Uh, things with very half li- half life you know maybe about a couple of hours and they actually do all their synthesis and everything uh, in half an hour 20 minutes 15 minutes okay so uh, so that was important and got everybody excited okay because there was a, th- a three and a half hour uh, life okay uh, but uh, the funny thing was that uh, what curie and savage said okay, uh, is that uh, Uh, you know uh, it seemed to them uh, that uh, what was being formed was a rare earth okay? that they seem quite certain about okay but they said uh, that uh, you know rare earth uh, you can imagine that if you uh, if you take uh, uh, the the rare earths okay over here you know and uh, uh, you know what could form okay was uh, uh something uh, uh, related to uh, uh, actinium okay 
and uh, so uh, but uh, what these people said is uh, that we don't seem to be forming uh, uh, actinium and to them it looked like something which resembled lanthanum okay more now lanthanum as you can imagine is one period up you know? so people said what is this i mean how is it possible that uh, uh, you will be forming uh, uh, lanthanum you know and uh, well they said that that's what we are uh, getting you know we are not uh, able to understand okay uh, what it is now you can also see uh, that if radium you know emits a beta radiation it will move over to actinium okay if barium emits a beta radiation it will move over to lanthanum so they said come on i mean lanthanum means i have to cross so many elements okay so nobody uh, took them very uh, seriously you know their assertion that it looks uh, like uh, lanthanum and they also say according to curie and savage the substance appeared to be a rare earth but was not actinium it had more resemblance to lanthanum and could only be separated from the latter by fractional crystallization okay with some hesitation curie and savage decided to include the substance in the trans uranium series but the possibilities put forward by them appeared difficult to understand and unsatisfactory so what happened was that uh, uh, you know uh, they said uh, curie and uh, savage basically uh, uh, backed out you know and they backtracked and uh, uh, sided with uh, fermi you know and said that no no it must be uh, a trans uranium you know uh, even this 3.5 was even though you know uh, it's starting to look like uh, some lanthanum or lanthanum uh, precursor okay now obviously you know khan was basically drawing on the work of others when fermi found the 13 uh, uh, minute element you know uh, uh, khan and meitner started working on that when uh, Curie and Savage found this, and it was much easier to work with uh, because it was much longer lived. You know, so they started working uh, again on uh, the work of Curie and Savage. Okay, so at this three point, as this three point five or element had been included with the trans uraniums, I together with Strassman tried to obtain it. After careful experiments, we arrived at remarkable results. which may be formulated approximately as follows in addition to the trans uraniums described by han meitner and strassman there are produced by two successive alpha emissions three artificial beta active radium isotopes with different half life time you know so that's what uh, uh, they felt you know that these are uh, the, what they had got uh, were radium isotopes radium isotopes looked uh, uh, reasonable because uh, uh, you know radium uh, uh, is uh, here and actinium thorium uranium uh, protactinium uranium so you are not really uh, violating this uh, uh, a few uh, elements to the left or few elements to the right you know? so uh, that's what they thought that they uh, got you know and so they worked out that how many of these uh, Uh, things will be happening okay uh, to arrive at uh, uh, these kinds of uh, uh, compounds okay so uh, that's what he says uh, alpha emissions three artificial beta active radium isotopes with different half life times which in their turn change into artificial beta active actinium isotope so they found that they thought that they had made radium okay the conclusion that radium isotope had been produced was the only one possible since according to the chemical properties only barium and radium could be considered barium was according to the physical viewpoint at this time impossible and thus only radium was left so they said you know in other words they more or less uh, found the same things that uh, curie and savage had found that it's a rare earth you know uh, which is uh, uh, which is obtained and they concluded that it must be radium you know uh, because uh, uh, barium would be uh, one period up you know 
and that's not practically feasible so it must be a uh, radia okay so uh, then what he says is and they said radium there's no issue you know if it is formed radium already uh, uh, i showed you the work of mary curie you know how she enriched uh, uh, radium okay uh, what they were doing was uh, uh, they were uh, uh, precipitating uh, barium sulfate and into which uh, radium sulfate was co precipitating then they were converting it into the uh, chlorides and then uh, doing repeated fractional crystallization and that's how radium uh, uh, was obtained you know in pure form so they said that's easy to do okay uh, so uh, they went about doing it and this is what they say the separation of this active group was performed by means of a barium precipitate not however in the form of barium sulfate which with its large surface strongly absorbs other elements okay so this was one of the problems with barium sulfate apparently that many of the impurities also do uh, get absorbed on uh, on the barium not just the uh, radium okay but on the suggestion of strassman as barium chloride okay so that's also not uh, that's all mary curie had shown that that you can convert barium sulfate into barium chloride by uh, treating it with carbon you know so that's effectively what they did which crystallizes very well from concentrated hydrochloric acid and which precipitates uncontaminated by other substances at the same time the production of radium under these conditions of radiation was very remarkable alpha decompositions had never been observed with neutrons low in energy and yet here as with the transuraniums a number of isotopes appeared simultaneously you know so uh, i mean it was really very very confusing situation now then what he says is the experiments were continued in various directions the preparations were however always very weak and the alpha rays and the most of the most stable of the new isotopes were so strongly absorbed uh, that thicker layers could only be investigated with poor yields of radiation in other words you know there were uh, many many issues okay around uh, this whole technique of uh, co precipitation and uh, and other things you know and some of the uh, radiation the alpha radiation also uh, could get absorbed by that so they had uh, a big struggle an attempt was therefore made to separate the artificial radium as far as possible from the barium added as carrier in order to obtain coatings permitting easier measurement this was done by fractional crystallization using the method of mary curie a method with which we had been thoroughly familiar over a number of years about 30 years previously i together with lise meitner had separated the radium isotope from mesothorium anyway it goes into a long story okay and then what he says is the attempts to separate out our artificial radium isotopes from barium in this way was very unsuccessful no enrichment of the radium was obtained and yet you know it was such a classical standard method which was developed by mary curie that if radium had been formed surely it could have been separated out from barium you know uh, i mean uh, that was very well known so what they said is that it's possible that the amount of radium being formed is very very tiny and uh, because of that you know there's a sensitivity problem and we are probably not able to uh, detect it you know so he says the attempts to separate out artificial radium uh, were unsuccessful no enrichment of the radium was obtained it was natural to ascribe the lack of success to the exceptionally low intensity of our preparations it was always a question of merely a few thousand of atoms which could only be detected as individual particles by the geiger uh, muller counter such a small number of atoms could be carried away by the great excess of inactive barium without any increase or decrease uh, being perceptible you know so they said that it really may be just a concentration issue you know and uh, and then you know is now if you are suspecting that it is a concentration issue what might you do next what experiment will you uh, might you want to try
okay so they basically from after bombarding the uh, the uranium with uh, uh, with neutron in a particular with a particular intensity they got the three and a half hour uh, life uh, 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 intermediate okay and from which you know uh, they suspected that radium was being formed but they suspected that maybe the amount of radium being obtained is very low and that's the reason why they are not able to uh, get this you know so uh, what might you uh, do as an experiment understood the question so uh, basically you know this problem had to be resolved they are suspecting radium but they are not getting radium sir could we do like a solvent extraction like we do for uranium to separate it out something similar maybe you mean from the barium huh yes sir yeah, so you are saying that you know uh, try some alternative uh, uh, things but you know up till that point okay then you would have to do uh, uh, research on such separations because the only thing that was known to work till that point was this fractional crystallization you know? i mean it's a good idea uh, you could uh, do it uh, but any other uh, uh, i mean i am just saying to rule out i am not even talking about a positive identification i am just trying to uh, say that uh, uh, to rule out the possibility of uh, it being due to a low concentration Oh, sir, can we uh, do flame tests for barium and radium? So we we know the flame test result for barium. So right, but you know you can imagine that we are talking about traces of uh, radium, you know, uh, in a very large excess of barium. Okay, so uh, so that's why I'm saying that uh, uh, you know uh, uh, you can uh, look at all those. okay but uh, uh, that's the issue you know when i'm talking about finding a needle in a haystack you know can you really do it by a flame test that flame of barium will mask all the other flames yes anything else think smart we dissolve the barium chloride yeah and uh, and then we can uh, detect the radium because the concentration of barium ions will be very low detect uh, uh, say that again you'll detect the you'll you'll dissolve the barium chloride yes so because the barium atoms are so large that they are masking the presence of radium so if we dilute the concentration no, no, barium atoms are so large means radium in the number barium no 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 in the number ha 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 yeah but that is precisely what fractional crystallization is i mean what you are saying okay that is what it is no i mean you are uh, fractionating between a solid phase and a liquid phase through a fractional crystallization no anything else okay so uh, you know what uh, this did was a very smart experiment no what they said is okay i mean let us put in some actual radium no? which we know is radium okay uh, we are not talking about speculating formation of radium Uh, from uh, from this you know uh, so they and they the whatever concentration that they were suspecting okay uh, to that kind of a uh, you know they were they were doing a spiking okay with the radi radium that is normally obtained okay uh, from uh, uh, let's say ores and things like that okay so so they put it in and they put it in at that concentration which they thought is a very low concentration and they said okay if it is a concentration effect uh, then i should not be able to even uh, separate out this radium which i put in you know and so they said uh, let us carry out an experiment so in order to check this we repeated the same test 
with a weak intensity of the natural radium isotopes mesothorium and thorium x these substances were freed from every trace of their parent substance and decay products with the greatest care and by systematic dilution preparations were made which were only just detectable with the geiger muller counter and uh, so you know uh, that's what they uh, did with uh, they just took the natural radium uh, uh, radium crystallizations were carried out with the chlorides bromides and chromates always with the corresponding barium salt as carrier so they just stuck to uh, Marie Curie's uh, uh, process the result was as was to be expected for radium that mesothorium and thorium x these are all radium isotopes were concentrated in the first fractions of the salts named and in fact in quantities such as we should expect from our previous experience this proved that the few atoms of natural radium isotopes also behaved in exactly the same manner as strong preparations in other words it was not a concentration effect it is not it was uh, not because of concentration of uh, radium being so low uh, that they missed it out okay so uh, that added to the mystery okay so then they were more or less forced to conclude that it cannot be radium then how how can it be radium because the natural radium i am able to separate out but if i am not able to separate out this at similar concentrations why should it be radium okay. so finally we proceeded to direct indicated test okay we mixed the pure natural radium isotopes with our artificial radium isotopes okay radium in inverted commas also previously freed from their decay products and fractionated the mixture in the same way as before the result was that the natural radium isotopes could be separated from barium but the artificial ones could not so not only did they do a separate experiment with the natural radium they actually spiked the their uh, uh, you know irradiated product okay with some natural radium and they could separate out the radium okay. and uh, you know so we check the results in still another way if the artificial alkaline earth isotopes were radium then the decay products produced directly through beta emission should consist of actinium from the element 88 should be produced the element 89 if on the other hand it was barium then lanthanum should be formed from element 56 the next higher element 57 with the aid of the pure actinium isotope mesothorium 2 we carried out an indicated test by mixing mesothorium 2 with one of the known primary decay products of artificial radium isotopes and then carrying out the chemical separation of actinium and lanthanum by the method of madam curie during the fractionation of lanthanum oxalate with actinium the latter accumulates in the final fraction this actually occurred with the actinium isotope the decay product of a so called radium isotope however remained with the lanthanum in other words you know they were never able to separate out the radium isotope you know come what they uh, how hard they tried okay the artificial rare earth which had been considered to be actinium was really lanthanum and that's the reason why they could not separate out lanthanum from lanthanum thus it was established that the alkaline earth isotope from which you know you get the lanthanum okay which we had believed to be radium was in fact an artificial active barium the lanthanum could have been produced only from barium and not from radium okay so uh, that's remarkable you know so they started looking at uh, not only the rare earth you know but they actually started looking at the product obtained from the rare earth to beta radiation beta decay and from uh, barium you'll get lanthanum and from uh, uh, radium you'll get actinium okay and uh, you know so uh, what they said 
is that they could never separate out the actinium, which they thought that they might have formed from the lanthanum. And therefore, you know, the only conclusion that they could draw is that it was lanthanum, it was not actinium. Okay. And if it was lanthanum, uh, then it must have been obtained uh, from uh, beria. Okay. So, uh, so effectively, uh, if you go back to the periodic table, you know, so this is barium, which will give you lanthanum. Radium will give you actinium. Okay. When you take a mixture of the two, you can separate them out. You know, there's no problem. But when they, you know, try to do that with their artificial mixture, they could never separate out the actinium from the lanthanum. And therefore, they concluded that it must be lanthanum itself. Okay. And therefore, you know, there's no other choice uh, but basically to conclude uh, that barium. Uh, is what it was. The rare earth, uh, which they had always thought to be radium, was actually barium. Okay, so uh, so that's what I've written here. The next they next looked at the separation of actinium and lanthanum. Why lanthanium? Lanthanum because it was mentioned fleetingly by Curie and Savage. They don't say that, you know. That in other words, you know, this uh, Otto Hahn was a master opportunist. You know, he actually seized on these speculations made, whether it was by Ida Nordak, whether it was by Irene Curie, you know, and then, you know, push, pushes them aside. You know, doesn't talk about them after that. Okay? Uh, and that's the only reason why he would have done that experiment. Okay? And uh, uh, so added actinium could be separated out and detected, but not the actinium that supposedly would have formed from the decay of radium. Radium was not formed at all. It was barium. You know? So that was the uh, conclusion. <clears throat> and the reason why they could never succeed you know, with their uh, barium radium uh, uh, separations by the process of Marie Curie was that, I mean, how can I separate out barium from barium? And it was not radium. You know? So it, it actually was barium. Okay. So, uh, I mean, and that's what led to this whole uh, uh, comedy of errors, you know, uh, because uh, you, you're trying to separate out uh, something from something when both of those somethings are the same. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so, uh, and then, of course, you know, uh, they, uh, they were first rate, uh, 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 you know, uh, analytical chemists. I must tell you that the the rigor uh, with which they work, that is the take home message that I want to leave you with. You know, if you are suspecting that you have hit upon okay, a very big idea, you know, don't be casual uh, in, uh, uh, in how rigorously you uh, reach your conclusions. Okay? I, I mean, you must uh, be paranoid and you must always think, I must have got something wrong. Let me try and check it out. Okay. And then he says, you know, in order to make quite certain, we carried out a so-called cycle with barium. The most stable of the active isotopes now identified as barium was freed from active decay products and other impurities by recrystallization with inactive barium. One quarter of the total quantity was kept for comparison and three quarters were subjected to the following cycle of barium precipitation. Barium chloride, then barium succinate, barium nitrate, barium carbonate, barium ferrimanite, barium chloride. You know, so what they thought is, okay, let us check out what happens in that case. After passing through this series of compounds, many of which crystallize beautifully, the resulting barium chloride and the recrystallized comparison preparation were measured alternately using the same counter with equal weights and equal thicknesses of layers. The initial activity and the increase as the result of further formation of the active lanthanum were the same for both preparations. Within the limits of error, the crystallization of so many and such different salts had produced no separation of the active barium from the carrier. It could only be concluded that the active product and the carrier were chemically identical, that is barium. You know? And that was 
uh, really the experimental verification you know, that it is a really nuclear so-called fission, you know, which had uh, taken place. In other words, uh, there must have been a big chunk, you know, of the nuclei which fragmented out. It's not that beta radiation, alpha radiation, you know, you know and those kinds of radiation, but something else happened exactly like Ida Nodak had uh, speculated, okay? And which, you know, Irene Curie actually found lanthanum but got scared, you know, didn't want to uh, break with convention and they backed out. Now, let me tell you, it's always nice, uh, as I told you, to look at your own work. I'm not necessarily saying what work you've done now, what work you may do in the future, you know, and keep this in mind. I remember, you know, around uh, 1999, uh, you know, we, our la a lab in uh, Bhavnagar had uh, made an a, a anti-tubercular extract, you know, uh, from, uh, from a halophyte, a salt-loving uh, plant. In, in between 1999 and 2005, uh, that was probably the biggest lead in India, you know, uh, in the discovery of a new anti-tubercular. It was outstanding. Okay? And, uh, you know, exactly like these people had done, uh, you know, we started doing... Uh, fractionating okay and we, we wanted to uh, really get to the active constituent you know so we kept on you know separating out things and seeing that yes the activity is increasing so we knew that we are going in the right direction that we are enriching okay uh, and at one point you know we got uh, an active which was about 32 what 32 nano nanogram per uh, kilogram of body weight you know uh, that kind of an activity and these activity measurements were being done by another laboratory, the Central Drug Research Institute, you know. So, uh, and it was really wonderful. I, I remember I and uh, my colleague who discovered this, J.B. Pandya, uh, we actually, you know, I said, hey, Mr. Pandya, uh, uh, you know, because it is from a salt-loving plant, you know, can we just taste it and see <laughs> what it tastes like? I mean, of course, I don't think we suspected that it will be uh, toxic. It was not the right thing to do. You know, and we tasted it, and it tasted sweet, like sugar. Okay? And, uh, uh, you know, every analysis that we did, okay, showed that the uh, molecule is, uh, is just like a sugar. Okay? Uh, and, uh, but then sugar does not have anti-tubercular activity, not the sugar that we know. Okay, the glucose, fructose, uh, uh, sucrose, you know, um, you know, all these patents were uh, granted. Uh, it must be that there is a different uh, conformation of a sugar, uh, which was formed by the plant, which we were never able to separate out from the actual sugar. You know? It was very frustrating, you know, for over about five to seven uh, years, you know. And so I, I can see the pain of not being able to uh, actually separate out something is very frustrating. But at some point, you know, uh, that uh, uh, Han had the guts uh, to say that no, uh, enough is enough. We have formed barrier. You know, uh, that's remarkable. Okay? And that's exactly what they uh, did. Okay? Now, in fact, it's, it's put together very nicely by this person, uh, Segre. Uh, he's the one who discovered the element uh, technetium, you know, and also one of the very fundamental particles called antiproton, you know, and uh, Segre is an uh, Italian guy, and uh, uh, he, uh, you know, today all this PET scan, you would have heard, you know, medical diagnostics is one of the big things, PET scan for whole body cancer detection and things like that. So Segre discovered uh, technetium, and this is what he wrote, you know, about uh, the work. Burmese group bombarded uranium with neutrons in 1934. But it was almost five years before Han and Strassman realized what these neutrons were actually doing. It required superb chemists to bring the comedy of errors to a close. You know? uh, and I, I was just thinking, comedy of errors? You know? uh, if only people had taken Ida Nodak a bit seriously, or maybe they did and they pretended that they didn't. 